had uh, recognized somebody else. Uh, I, I recognized this person, and I'll give you a chance. Um, I just, so we, we recognized the, the, the beheadings had their, the effect that ISIS was looking for, it, it scared Americans, um, it alarmed us, and we have this whole like bubble of terror above us, and we're freaking out. Um, but then what, if you don't think we should have boots on the ground, which I don't think so either, and we already, um, he's already in a coalition, but what would you do instead? Are we just gonna like leave them to their own devices, or well, what are you afraid of? each other? What are you afraid of? <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I mean, just I, don't I mean, think. I mean, I don't like Americans being beheaded, <laughs> um, but I know, like, I also don't think it's okay for all of those people to be subject to, because not everyone agrees with what's going on. And I, I maybe from a Western point of view, I've grown up. Um, Americans always put our toes in every place, so I guess maybe I'm used to that. Maybe we should. I think we should do it again, but I don't. I just want to hear more of what you think we should do instead. A lot depends on what you think the risk is. Okay, you started out by talking about the beheadings. Mm -hmm. If we think that the risk is terror in the United States, then I think what we have to do is we have to accept the fact that there's nothing we can do about that. Okay? The flaw in American politics is that the American people were led to believe after 9-11 that somehow we have a right to demand 100% security. That's false. That's why Obama's boxed in here, okay? Because of the public uproar after seeing the beheadings, people wanted to say to Obama, make sure my head isn't cut off. Well, if you remember a year ago, a Brit had his head cut off, just randomly, in the street, by someone who was associated with a jihadist organization. But this wasn't an organized thing. It wasn't a terror group. It was a, a, some guy who just really pissed off wanted to articulate his anger by killing uh, what he thought was his oppressor, and he did so. That's gonna happen. We have to get over this juvenile belief that we can have 100% security. If we're willing to put up with people who kill our children in Newtown, Connecticut, or movie doors in Aurora, uh, Colorado, we can certainly put up with someone from another country coming in and killing a couple of people. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I want to give it a different thought. If I were asked what to do, first of all, I think maybe we've misinterpreted the purpose of the beheading. I, I think this. I think that that ISIS, of, of all the things that Ron said, most of all, it's a criminal syndicate. More than any, I mean, that's a better way of understanding. It's a warlord. Al Bahadi, Baghdadi, Baghdadi is a warlord, like Jonas Savimbi of UNITA in Angola, and Charles Taylor, and the Northern Front in Afghanistan. Uh, these Ito are, Corleone. What, yeah, that's right. It, with, a, with a religious face, like some of them have a revolutionary face, or a nationalistic <laughs> face, or a sectarian face, but they're, they're basically warlords who are in it for the here and now, not for the hereafter for what power they can exercise and what wealth they could accumulate. And I think the beheadings were to raise the price of hostages. That's, that's what I think was, was the per may, that may have had unintended consequences, but I think that that's really, uh, they have other hostages, they'll get more hostages, and the price just went up tenfold to get them free. It was a business proposition. At least I think that's one way of possibly interpreting it. And I think that instead of viewing this as, as a uh, formidable army with the capacity you know, to bring down states, I think we should view them as, as akin to the Mexican drug lords and treat it as a criminal enterprise that can be uh, not, not, not entirely stopped, but if you can hamper their criminal activity sufficiently, it will collapse of itself. I don't think it's all powerful. I think that it's, that it's uh, inherently fragile, depends on a steady stream of cash to pay all these soldiers, 
and to pay for the services. And if you deprive them of that steady cash, it will collapse. It will disintegrate of its own weight. So our strategy should be, how do you starve ISIS of its operating funds? And if that's the strategy, it can't be 100% perfect, but I think it can be <coughs> much more, much cheaper and much less dangerous than sending bombers. Don't forget we said the same thing about opium and the Taliban. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. We collaborated with those folks. We were collaborate. We, we, we protect the At one opium point, operation. at another point, we tried to eliminate I, I, I don't think that's. I don't think that's serious. I think that, that was just a cover. I think the U.S. all along was tolerating opium as long as it was our guys and not the other guys. There's another point I'd like to uh, restate. Uh, Michael says we ought to look at, at uh, the Islamic State as essentially a criminal enterprise. What I was saying before is that these kinds of organizations have more than one face. Yeah. And we have to try to hold this in our head yeah. at the same time. I do not um, undervalue or, or uh, misunderstand the genuineness of religious belief that's involved uh, here with a, with a lot of people. I, I say again, for a lot of the fighters, it's not necessarily the $400 a month, it's the thrill of being involved in this, in this great adventure. So I, it's, it's difficult to, to keep... That's, you know, the that's true of all warlord uh, criminal entities. They all have a political, religious, or some face that motivates some guys to go out and risk their life on behalf of these principles. But that's, that's not what's really driving it. Well, What's really driving it is a matter of analysis, and, and we could disagree about that. All I'm saying is that all these things, these things are going uh, on at the same time. And it, it, what what really said about America's allies, you know, who are our allies? Um, states have no friends; they have only interests. You know, classic uh, statement. It's not absolutely true, and every country in that region is almost every country is to some extent an ally and to some extent not an ally. So there too it's complexity. You have to try to hold this in your mind when you're analyzing the problem. Even Israel, as we saw, as, as we've seen in several instances, uh, is not an absolute is not of an absolute identity of use with the United States. So what I would emphasize is it's a good idea to stay away from absolutes. The United States understands nothing. Here's Islamic State. They know exactly what they're doing. They have a, they have a strategy on a piece of paper. Uh, it's not likely to work out at all. Uh, the American policy is not likely to be as disastrous and, and one-sided based on a lack of understanding as it has been suggested. So um, the idea that we should do nothing, I, you know, I couldn't accept that. I think a lot of Americans couldn't accept that. I think a lot of people in that neighborhood want very much that the United States intervene, perhaps beginning with the Kurds. And you know, uh, what should we do in Syria? That's really complicated. But let's remember that it's complicated. 